Hello, Richard here, and today again you find me in the workshop, and I've got a little job on today, which is to make a, uh, a brass adapter for a pressure washer. Now, a few weeks ago, it was time to clean the car. We just come through a really horrible, sleety winter, and the car needed a really good clean. So I got all the kit out. I got the pressure washer out. I got the pressure washer set up. I got the hose pipe run out. I got the mains power run out. I got all the sort of towels and the soaps and all of that sort of stuff set up. Had my foam cannon ready to go. Got the pressure washer, not this one by the way, uh, but I got my pressure washer and pulled the trigger and water just ran all the way down my arm and none out the end. By this time it was about three o'clock in the afternoon before the clocks had changed, so it was about to get dark in about an hour. So I had a couple of choices. I could either try and fix the pressure washer, since I've got everything all set up, or I could go out and try and buy a new one of these. Now, my pressure washer is like a really old Halfords branded thing from 20 odd years ago. All you can really buy locally in the local shops would be like Karcher type ones, the mainstream ones with their own sort of quick release fittings. So buying one wasn't really an option. So I thought, well, let's see if we can fix it. Now this is the actual one that was broken. So I took it apart and I found that basically this housing here had cracked. So what I'll do, let me bring you in a little bit closer and then I can show you exactly what the problem was. Okay, so this is the internal of the old gun assembly and the bottom here, this is where the high pressure would come in from the high pressure hose from the pressure washer and you've got the sort of the valve assembly in here and you can see here, this is where it cracked. So you can see there's a crack on there um, and it's cracked underneath as well and that's where the water was just pouring out, none was making it up the nozzle. So, so what I thought was I could either maybe put a Jubilee clip on there and just clamp it temporarily or I could clean it up and weld it get a little bit of MIG weld on there and that might just keep it going long enough to get the car cleaned. So when I looked at it, I thought, okay, well, it just looks like cadmium plated steel. So I cleaned it up a little bit and uh, got it all set up and put a clamp on it to close the gap up, got it in the vise, got the MIG welder out and ah, yeah, Mount Vesuvius, just a whole load of fizzing. And uh, I then learned that it's actually aluminium um, because I assumed that it was steel. So the lesson to be learned from that is never assume anything because assume makes an ass of you and me. Um, and it certainly made an ass of me on this occasion. So that was that blown up. That wasn't gonna be any use after that. Um, it was then a very second hand part. So then, okay, the option then is basically buy a new gun. The problem I've got is my pressure washers, as I say, is this really ancient Halfords thing and it doesn't use any of the modern day fittings. So in the end, I managed to find this one on eBay which wasn't too expensive. This is a more sort of old school one where it's just got a standard threaded inlet for the high pressure and it's got a M22 outlet as well. I wanted to get one like this because I've got sort of things like this. I've got the Lance that would fit on there. That's the original Lance. And I've got um, a foam cannon which would fit on this as well. So I didn't want to have to buy all new tools to match um, like a Karcher part or anything like that. But the problem then is that my the high pressure hose from my pressure washer is an M14 thread and this is an M22, so I need an adapter. Well, looking around on eBay, I found all kinds of adapters, M14 to M22, but they were so badly described and all the drawings were so kind of rubbish that I wasn't convinced I'd actually be buying something that would fit because they would like describe one end as M22 and then the other end as M15. It would be a 14 millimeter M15 thread. So it was just too iffy. So I thought, well, I don't really want to do that. Plus I'd have to wait for the thing to arrive. So instead what I did was I used it as an excuse to buy more tools, which is always a good thing. So what I did, instead of spending 10 pounds on an adapter, I spent 10 pounds on a block of brass, 25 mil across flats hex brass bar, and another 10 pounds on a, uh, an internal threading tool, which I can then use to actually make an adapter. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this, we're gonna chomp about 25 mil or one inch off the end, I had to measure up, but something like that. Then we'll get it up in the chuck, we'll bore it out, cut an internal thread that will fit on here. And then on the other end, we'll flip it around in the chuck, take that down to a suitable diameter and we'll put an M14 external thread on that end. And we're gonna make our own little pressure adapter. And so with that, okay, it's cost me twice as much to buy this as to just buy an adapter, but it means I'm gonna end up with this much brass bar left over and one of these. Gotta be a winner all round, I'd say. All right, so that's the backstory and the plan. So let's head over to the lathe and uh, start cutting this into pieces. Okay, so I've got a bit of 25 mil brass hex in the chuck and got quite a bit of stick out here because the brass is um, too thick to go through the hole in the center of the chuck. Uh, I think the chuck can take a 21 mil diameter and this is 25 mil AF across the flats. So I'm gonna have to start working on it with it protruding. Now I need to pass off about 23 mil off the end I don't really want to be parting off this far out unsupported. 
So what I'm going to do first of all is I'm just going to face the end off and then center drill it. We'll get a live center in and then we'll see if we can uh, part it off. Even if I can part it off part way and then saw the rest with a hacksaw, that'll be good. It just wouldn't be so much fun having to manually hacksaw this all the way. What I'm going to do before we get started is I'm just going to check the uh, the alignment of this. I'm just going to tram this in a bit with a, a dial indicator. Uh, there's not a lot I can do if this is actually a bit wonky other than sort of loosen the chuck and try and realign it. Just for my own sanity, I'm going to put the dial gauge on and just run it backwards and forwards just to see if it's roughly square. And that's not too bad. It dial stands a bit rubbish, so that gives me a bit of backlash anyway. But that's not looking too bad. A few tenths of a mil there, so that'll be plenty okay in terms of run outs. All right, let's get the... Uh, get the tool in there and uh, we'll just face off the end, clean that up and then we can centre drill it. Okay, a little more to go there. Okay, that'll do. Right, so let's uh, centre drill it. Okay, that's good for that. So let's uh, clean off the swarf, take the centre drill out, and then we'll uh, put a live centre in, and then we can see about uh, getting it parted off. See how that runs. Okay, right, so we get the parting tool. I'm just gonna check that that's square against the, uh, the face of the chuck. Just lining the tool up with the chuck to see if it's square. It looks pretty good actually. Might need to go around just a tiny little bit. Okay, right, so now we just need to measure in how far we want to part off and we'll start parting. Okay, so I've done up a bit of a drawing of what we need to make. 
Um, I don't know how well you can see that on the camera. I hope you can see it well enough. Um, it, it's done in Fusion 360. I basically modeled it and then printed a drawing. So it tends to print very thin, faint lines. So hopefully you can make out some of that. Um, basically, this is the dimension we want to begin with. The, the overall length of it's going to be 23 millimeters. So that's where we're going to pass off to. So we'll probably pass it off just slightly over 23 mil, and then we can just face a little bit off to tidy it up and carry on with the rest of it. Okay, so we want 23 mil. So what I'll do is I'll just offer this up on here. Um, now I'm going to make sure I got the lead screw disengaged. So let me just test that first. I'm just going to make sure this is all out of the way. Fire it up. Yep, lead screws off. Gearbox is in neutral. So I'm going to lock the lead screw. Let me just uh, get this roughly in the ballpark. I'm going to lock the lead screw off just to stop, resist any sort of movement this way. And then on the uh, compound slide, I'll just tune this into 23. I'll go slightly past. It's not critical, this dimension. So as long as I'm just slightly over, that'll be okay. That looks good. Right. Moment of truth then. Let's see how this uh, parts. Get the centre back in there. And we'll see what we get. It's going to get a little bit of a get a little bit of WD forty on that some lube.
Okay, well that's uh, that's cut really nicely, but I'm running out of cutter now. I'm going to have to extend the uh, the cutter out a little bit further so I don't hit. So let's just do that, and then we'll give it another try. Okay, because the uh, the cutter will have raised up a bit, so I'm just going to lower the uh, tool down a tiny little bit to compensate for that. That should do it, and uh, see how we get on this time. Okay, that's about as far as I want to take that with the live center in place. So let's just get that out of the way, see if it will still part without the center, see if we can, uh, don't get too much vibration and see how we get on with that. A little bit more lube as well. Let's answer that one, that's as far as we can take that. So, uh, all right, hacks where it is. Okay, not that I don't trust myself, but I don't trust myself. So a little bit of wood on the table, just in case I slip and follow through with a hacksaw. Told you, there you go. It's a good job I put that piece of wood there, wasn't it? All right, so there we go. That's the uh, finished piece. Well, I say finished, the piece cut off to length. So we can put this back up in the chuck, face that off and uh, go from there. All right, let's get this faced off. Okay, we've got a little bit of a pip there, so we'll see if we can just raise the tool up a tiny bit. Let's give that a little try. Okay. What have we got? 
we got? Okay, that's looking nice. Just going to check the uh, depth of that. So we, we're looking for 23 or thereabouts. That's going to be spot on, but let's see what we've actually got. Just unlock this. And we've got 23.26, quarter of a mil over. That's all right. I'm not going to split hairs over that. Right, so next thing we need to do is to get this now bored out. So we'll lose this. And we want to bore this out to an inside diameter of 20.53, 11 millimeters deep. Okay, so the next thing we need to do is to start to bore this out. So let's just move the tool post out of the way. And what I'm going to do is just going to center drill it just to get it started. Now the hole through the, uh, the center all the way through is a four mil hole, but I'm not gonna go all the way through with the four mil drill. I'm just gonna get it started because when we uh, work on the other end, I'm gonna want the, the hole to be concentric with the up from the other end, not from this end, just in case there's any discrepancy. So what I'm gonna do is just start working up through the drill sizes just to rough out most of the metal. And for this, this is gonna be 11 millimeters deep, this bore. So we'll just make a start roughing it out. And it's only gotta be fairly rough. It doesn't have to be spot on as usual. usual. Okay, so that's that roughed out, and now we can just uh, continue with boring it. So we'll fit in a little boring tool. And what I've got down here, you can just see this, I've got the little, uh, this is basically made out of an old digital tire depth, depth gauge. Um, bought off eBay for about four quid, four pounds, and I've basically 3D printed a base with a magnet. So this can actually act as like a poor man's DRO. So if I go to the edge there, you can see it zeros. So I can use that to tell me how deep I am when I'm boring. Although I try not to be boring. What we'll do is we'll just get this touched off and then we can start to bring the diameter out. And we want to bring that out to 20.53 for the thread we're cutting. giving quite a nice finish inside there right let's have a check of that 20.5 that'll do because this is a thread anyway so um you know we're going to be cutting a thread within that so i think that's pretty good i don't want to don't want it to be oversized particularly so that's going to be good enough 
Okay, what I'm going to do, I'm going to just take one last travel in. I'm going to go slightly over the 11 mil, and then I'm going to back the cutter out that way just to square off the face in the back a little bit. Okay, and that's the finished ball ready for tapping. Let me just see if I can bring you in a little bit closer on that. I don't know how close this can, thing can focus, but uh, give you a bit of an all round sort of look at that. And there's a little close up of our DRO device. So we can get rid of the reflection off the screen as best I can for you. All right, next for some thread cutting. Okay, so we're getting set up to cut the internal thread on our adapter. So I'll just sort of walk you around the setup we've got. So we'll start off around here on the uh, on the gearbox end. And the first thing to do really is to set up the, the gearing uh, for the pitch that we want. Now, the thread pitch we're cutting, it's an M22 by 1.5 millimeter pitch. And the gears we need are 42, 60, 60, and 40. Uh, but I've already set those up. So here we've got a 40 tooth gear here. We've got 60 here. Now, as it is, this actually calls up for two 60s. So you, you would actually only need to fit one of these. Um, I realized that after I fitted both, but you'd only need the one. And so we've got 40, 60, 60, 40. So that gives us our reduction down to a 1.5 millimeter pitch for our screw. And you might notice on here as well, if I, uh, if I show you down here, I've got some scribble on here. Uh, the other day I had to cut a full BA thread, which has um, an unusual pitch well for metric anyway which is um not listed on the list here so what i did was there's a, there's a really useful website you can go to and i'll put a link in the description so you can go and have a look yourself basically pump in all the various gears that you have into this calculator so you list all the gear wheels that you own tell it what pitch you're trying to achieve and then it'll give you various combinations of gears that will actually give you that pitch now 0.66 that was really close to 4BA. I think 4BA is actually 0.67 millimeters, but that was way good enough for what I needed to do. So I made a note of it on here, but just bear that in mind, if a pitch isn't listed on here, it doesn't mean you can't do it. It just means that these are just the, like the favorites. These are the most sort of common metric pitches you're gonna need, but don't think that's exhaustive. You can just go online, use the calculator, and then you can work out whatever pitch you wanna do within reason. All right, so what you might also notice is we got this gadget sticking out here. Let me move that out of the way. Uh, this is my mandrel handle. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be hand cranking the lathe to cut this thread. And there's a few reasons for doing that, which we can talk to when we get over to the uh, the pointy end over here. But basically, this is a handle, and uh, I made it myself a few weeks back. This here is a bit of acetole bar. That's turned down and fits inside the lathe shaft, the lathe spindle. And in the end of that, there's a taper board into it, which has a correspondingly shaped acetole plug. And then there's a drawbar here that goes through into the plug. And when you tighten this nut up, it basically pulls the, uh, the tapered cone into the end of this shaft, which has some slots cut in it. And it expands it in there and it grips it. For the handle, I 3D printed a handle for it. If you wanted to make one of these, you could just make this out of wood or aluminium or whatever you've got, anything would do. Then here, there's just a bit of a uh, threaded steel bar with uh, another bit of acetal on there as a handle. So that means we can hand crank the lathe. We can turn it by hand. We don't have to power feed or anything like that. And this gives us a lot of control when we're cutting threads. One thing with the, um, the 3D printed handle, if I made another one of these, which I may do, what I'd do is these three screws here, I'd actually rotate them 60 degrees so that there's a screw here and a screw here and nothing in the middle. And then I'd put a web in because this is a little bit flexy and it's a bit annoying when you're using it. So anyway, that's the, the gearbox end. So let's go over to the pointy end and we'll have a look at how that's all set up over there. All right, so here we are back at the sharp end of things and we've got a bit of a complicated setup today for this and um, I'll just walk you around what we've got and why we've got it the way we have. So over here, we've got a, a mag base, which has got a dial gauge attached to it. And the dial gauge is basically measuring how 
far in and out the cross slide is. So the cross slide being this angle to the bed, perpendicular to the bed. What we're using the cross slide for is to engage and disengage the cutter from the thread. So we bring the cutter into the thread, we take a cut, and then we extract the cutter from the thread with a cross slide, and then we feed the cutter back out again. Then we come in and we can zero things back up the cross slide and take another cut. Now what we do for that is basically over here on the dial gauge, this is zero, this will be zero. We'll do that in a minute, but we'll zero the dial gauge so that when we touch off on the inside of the bore, we'll zero this. And then that means that we know that if we extract the cutter from the thread, if we wind this back to zero, we know that we're exactly where we started off. To actually feed the cutter into the thread, we use the compound slide. And the compound slide, that's set to 29 degrees. Now, the reason for that is that if we look at a, uh, a standard metric thread, a standard metric thread profile is 60 degrees. So what we're doing is we're basically setting the uh, the compound slide to half of that. We're feeding the cutter in in this direction. So rather than just feeding the cutter straight into the thread this way and taking a full cut, we're basically feeding it in at 29 degrees, approximately half the thread angle. The reason for that is basically if I um if I grab a threading tool, if you imagine that uh, this is our the tool we're using, and the tool is cut at 60 degrees, if we feed this straight in the tool's going to be cutting the thread on both edges at the same time. So it's basically cutting the full depth of cut on this face and this face. If we feed the tool in at half its angle, so if we feed the tool in at an angle like this, basically what it means is that as we feed in, only this face really is doing any cutting. This face is doing a minimal of cutting, and most of the cutting is happening just on a single face. So. Basically, that reduces the tool pressure. Uh, the tool pressure basically being how hard this is having to push into the work. Because we're using a mini lathe and it's a little bit flexible and not that rigid and so on, um, it just helps a little bit. And this is quite a big thread to be cutting on this lathe. That's why we're feeding in at an angle like that. So the reason we choose 29 degrees and not 30 is that what this angle needs to be up to 30 degrees. If you go over 30 degrees, even a little bit, you're going too far and you're actually going to be changing the angle that you're cutting the thread at and you're going to get stepping in the finish of the thread. And we don't want that. Rather than sort of try and get it smack on 30 degrees. And if we're using a protractor like this, they're not the most accurate things in the world. So, you know, there's a chance if I set this to 30, it might be 30.5. So we set it to 29 and we're pretty much guaranteed we're not going to exceed that 30 degree angle. Okay, the next thing we've got here is we've got a depth stop. This is our good old uh, cheapo tire gauge depth stop. And with that, that's going to be set so that when we touch the face of the work here, if I touch the cutter against the face, this is going to be zero. So it's just slightly off. So I'll just hit the zero button. So that's our zero point. And then as I'm feeding the thread in, I can read off on here as we cut through the thread. I can read off until we get to 11 millimeters, which is the depth I want. When this gets to 11 millimeters, I know I'm at depth and then I can just use the compound slide to disengage the cutter from the thread, reverse it back out again, and then get ready for the next cut. So I said um, earlier on when we looked at the other end, the gearbox end, that we're gonna be uh, hand feeding this. The main reason for that is that hand feeding the threading tool as opposed to power feeding it, where we would actually power the, uh, the cutter into the thread. As we're going into a blind hole, in other words, the bottom of our hole is, is flat and we're feeding a cutter in, what we don't want is to sort of power feed the cutter and then disengage at the wrong point and actually crash the cutter into the end of the job. And that'd be really hard to gauge. For that reason, it's just easier and safer um, just to hand feed it. I can just crank the handle by hand and my hand is over there cranking at this moment, backs and forwards. So I can just crank it by hand until I'm in the right place. I don't have to worry about disengaging the half nuts at the right time or anything like that. And it's just a nice, easy, safe way to do it. Okay, so let's touch off and uh, we'll get everything zeroed up and then we can go from there. So to touch off, I'm just gonna touch off by eye on this one. So I'm just gonna manually feed the cutter out until I can just see it making a little scratch and then we'll call that zero. Okay, that's just touching. So what we'll do now is we'll, we'll zero the, uh, zero the dial indicator here and that tells us how we can return to zero so i'll just rotate this round this is a bit of a cheap and nasty dial indicator and uh and stand so it's a little bit flexible um i think the whole lot was like 20 pounds off ebay so it's not bad for the money really um right so that's our zero so we now know that that is basically 
the uh, the touch off point at the beginning of the thread. So that means that, as I say, we can use the cross slide now. We can disengage the thread and then we can come back to where we started by coming back to zero. What it's also worth noting as well is the um, the actual millimeters scale as well. So this is um, just under four. So we need to remember that it's easy to get lost if you've like wound this in a few turns. When you come back, it's not always obvious which zero you want. Do you want that zero? Or do you want that zero? So if you remember it's just below four, then it helps you to come home back to your zero point, and then you can go from there. So the next thing we need to do as well is to zero this off. Now this is pretty close actually. On the compound slide, we're just a, a snurred over zero there. So I'm probably gonna leave that where it is. We're all set and ready to go. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna lock in the lead screw. The lathe's already in gear and we can now start to cut some threads. So we begin with, I'll just feed it in, just do a sort of dry run to begin with until we get to our 11 millimeter depth. And this won't really be taking a cut. We can have a look inside, see if we've got any sort of scoring going on. So there we go, that's 11 mil. And looking inside, there's vaguest of scratches in there. So I'm just going to reverse it out at the stage without disengaging it. And then we can actually take a little cut. Yeah, so we'll just bring it out a little bit and we'll take a little scratchy cut and see where we end up. So you can just hear that just about scratching in there. We we'll bring this round to 11 mil. You see how much control we've got here. And then we'll disengage the tool, feed it back out in reverse. Now, the, the reason we have to sort of keep this in gear is because I don't have a, a thread indicator. So on, on a lot of lathes, you have a little thread dial indicator, which means you can disengage the feed and then re-engage it in the right spot. And I don't have that. So that's why I'm sort of keeping it constantly engaged. Okay, so now we've fed out. What I'll do is I'll basically bring the cross slide back to zero. So that was our zero just under four. A little bit of stiction on the old gauge there. That's not helpful, but there we go. Okay, and we'll just carry on feeding in. Okay, we'll give that a try. So yeah, 
pretty tight, so we'll take it a bit further. Okay, let's try that. So removing the tool didn't seem to upset the, uh, the zero too much. So we'll just wind it back a little bit. We can pop the tool off again. Carefully and uh, see how we're doing. That's really close now. So almost there. Still a little bit more, I think. It's, uh, it's a little bit tight. But really close now. There we go, right. And I think we're gonna call that done where it is. That's quite a nice fit, still got a bit of tightness to go. Um, I don't want it to be loose, I want this to be sort of pressure tight. And uh, I'll probably put a bit of plumber's tape on it, PTFE tape to seal it up, but happy with that and we'll call that end done. So what I'm gonna do is just do a little chamfer on the end both inside and out, it's a little bit of leading for the thread and a little bit of chamfer on the outside. And uh, we'll call that done. All right, let me just see if I can get you in a little bit closer. Have a look at the, uh, the thread. So that's what we've ended up with. Get you in there, hopefully that'll be in focus. All right, so let's get set up to Put a chamfer on this. I'm going to just turn the uh, compound slide around to 45 degrees so I can cut a chamfer. I could just use like a, a threading tool and just sort of come up against the edge and chamfer it that way but I'm going to actually use a compound slide because it'll give me a, a better finish on that. So what we need to do is wind this all the way back. This is a bit of a fiddle. It's one of the sort of downsides of these um, mini lathes is that it's a bit of a pain when you want to reconfigure things a bit like with the gearbox where um you know if you want to change the pitch of the lead screw you've got to actually physically change gears rather than on a sort of grown-up lathe you can actually change gears just by waggling levers um same with this on a on a bigger lathe you'd be able to just undo a couple of nuts and rotate the compound slide with this you have to sort of wind it all the way back out and undo some screws it's all right i mean you know it is what it is it's a cheap lathe it doesn't have all the bells and whistles and if you want all those sort of posh features then 
you can spend yourself a couple of thousand getting something a bit more adult sized um, anyway don't take long we'll just throw the tools all over the workshop in a tantrum <laughs> and we'll undo this and we'll rotate this back round to 45 degrees so what I'll do I'll just get my uh, protractor on that it doesn't have to be exact 45 ish and I'll probably go that way actually so 45 ish we'll just pop that on there get some of the swarf out of the way so we're not measuring swarf too much get that roughly on 45 that'll do we can just lock it off and then we can use that to take our cuts with and I'm just going to use the, uh, the threading tool to take a cut with just wind this back in don't have to wind it all the way because we're going to be probably changing its angle in a moment anyway so i just want to be able to come in here take a little cut off there with the uh, with that tool oops lock it in place it might help And to do that, I am going to need to just take the uh, mandrel out. You never, ever want to run a lathe with a handle in it. That's, that would be very bad. So let me just uh, remove that. And put it in neutral. You don't need to have it in gear anymore. And I'm just going to quickly pop the gearbox cover back on because again well it saves time to leave the guards off so when you're saving time in leaving the guards off that you end up losing a finger to something so we don't want to do that so I'll just quickly pop them back on just got to screw the guard cover on safety first and all that right so We'll turn the lathe back on and uh, start it off on a slow speed. Okay. gives us yeah that's good i like that excellent okay and what i'm going to do for the other chamfer on, on the outer chamfer um i'm just going to reverse the lathe and see if i can cut it on the back there save me how to sort of swivel everything around reconfigure everything so we'll uh, see if we've got enough reach to do that if i bring that in a bit closer that should help make this a bit more rigid as well and i just want to sort of find out where my widest diameter is on that so that I don't uh, take too much of a cut all in one go. Uh, good enough for government work I'd say all right I think we'll stop at that 
Next thing is to flip it round and then we can start to cut the external thread on the other end. So the next job is to cut the uh, 14 millimeter external thread onto this end of the piece. So I've turned this round in the chuck now, got a tool set up here so that we can um, turn down the diameter. But the first thing we need to do is to bore a four mil hole all the way through. So I want to bore the four mil hole from this end because the four mil hole only really affects this end of the job. Um, if I'd have bored it from the other way, it may have gone slightly off center. So um, that's the reason I'm doing it now. So we'll just put a four mil hole through here and go from there. So next we need to take this down to uh, 14 mil diameter and for eight millimeters of depth this way. Uh, I'm going to be manually feeding this because the lathe's already set up for the right gear ratios. As it happens, the M14 thread on here is M14 by 1.5. So we're already set to 1.5 mil pitch for the pre from the previous thread. So rather than sort of set the gearbox up for a fine feed, I'll just manually feed this in because it won't take too long anyway. Um, now I've got a little depth gauge set here. So I'm just going to check the zero on that. I'm just going to touch the cutter on the face of the work and see that this goes to zero, which it is near enough. Then that can tell me when I've fed in this way about eight mil, making sure the cutter just clears the edge of the hex because I don't want it to dig in. And then we can start to, we can touch off and start to turn this down to 14 mil. exactly so I'm just gonna take a slight little skim off that to take it slightly under 14 and then we'll uh, draw the tool back and see if we can clean up this face a little bit So that's that. So next thing we need to do is to put an undercut on here, give some space for the, uh, the thread to come over. So I'll put a parting tool in to do that. And then we'll just square the tool up. Again, I'll square that against the edge of the chuck jaw. Looks pretty good. And then we'll bring it in, just touch it off, slow the speed down, and we'll just uh, put a bit of an undercut in there for the thread to come off the end of.
do it. Okay, so next we need to get set up for thread cutting again. So we'll get all that set up and then I'll bring you back in again. We've got everything set up. I've got the handle mandrel back in there so I can manually rotate the, uh, the chuck. We've got the compound slice set at 29 degrees so we can feed in at an angle like we said earlier. Same for the um, internal thread. The cross slide is going to be our zero so we've got a dial gauge set up over here which we can set to zero when we touch off. We don't need to worry about the actual depth stop this time because, well, we just stop when we get to the end of the thread. So let's just touch off. And again, I'm just gonna do this manually, just see when I see a scratch, I'll know that I've uh, touched off. So let's feed into we uh, just touch the surface. There we go, a slight scratch. I'm just gonna back off a little bit and I'm gonna call that zero. So at this point, I'm gonna zero the dial gauge. And this is a rickety old thing, so quite a lot of backlash and horribleness with it. We'll just see, get as close as we can. That'll do. So we're on sort of three and a half. Remember, we need to keep an eye on the millimeters as well as the uh, tenths and hundredths because we need to sort of know we can come back to that point. So what we do now is we'll engage the lead screw and then we'll just take a little scratch pass over there. Okay, that's not doing anything, so that's all right. We'll feed in a little bit and just take a little scratch on there. Okay, the tool's coming very close to the work, but that's okay. We just won't need to touch that. So now we can back off a little bit, feed back the other way, bring the clock, cross slide back to zero. And then we can start to feed in a little bit. Okay, feed out, let's clear the work, reverse back the other way. Go back to zero, feed in a little more, rinse and repeat. Okay, let's just uh, see if we can try the part, see if that'll fit. So I'll just wind this out of the way. This is the drawback of doing it all manually, it takes a bit of time to do stuff like this. Okay, that's not far off actually. The uh, the cutter is in the way. Let me just take the cutter off carefully. Give me a bit more clearance. I don't want to disturb anything here. So let's do that quite gently. Do you know, I think that might be enough. I think that's actually uh, seated. It doesn't go in that far and there is a taper to cut yet. So. I think we've kind of nailed that in one, to be honest. So yeah, I don't know how well you can see that inside the hose, but there's a little tapered area here. So what we need to do is actually cut a little uh, taper inside the end now, and, uh, and we'll be done. So yeah, so what we'll do is next, we'll cut a little uh, chamfer in this four mil hole here, which is uh, on the drawing, that's a 50 degree angle chamfer in there. So we'll put on, a, I'll put a little boring tool on there so we can just cut a little chamfer in there, chamfer the edges off and we're done. Jobs are good. Un. Right. What I need to do is lose this. We don't need that for the moment. We'll disengage this. Don't need the handle anymore. So I'm just going to get that disconnected because we're going to need to power the, the lathe back up, get the feed powered up. So that's the 
What's the ha Acme handle removed? And we'll pop the guard back on over the gearbox. All right. Uh, put the gear in neutral because we won't be needing any feed. What I'm going to do as well, I'm just going to refit the tray at the back. Now, what I've done with this, because this does need to go, come on and off of quite a bit. Um, when you first get these, they're basically fixed in place with one, two, three, four, five cap head screws. Sorry, there you go, one there as well. Um, I think they might only put three in, but it's a pain because trying to reach around the back and undo little cap heads is a real faff. So what I did is I, I've got a little pin around at the back just under here. I don't know if you can see that or not. Let me get my finger on it. Uh, it's just about here. It's a little peg I've made that actually locates where this is. So, so the tray just goes onto that little pin. And then down here, I made up a little screw with a long little bolt. Now it's actually split a little bit. I need to remake this. I made the wall a little bit thin, but this then just basically pops down under here. So this basically goes over, I've made up this special bolt on here. So I just pop that over there and I don't even have to really look. Then this just locates over that. Twiddle it up and that's it. So sort of quick release uh, chip tray, which is quite handy. Uh, as I say, I need to make another one of these at some point because I made this one a little bit thin at this part. So I'll make another one of those and I might do a video of that if you're interested. Now we've got the chip tray in there, we can just use it for what it's designed for and flick some of these chips to the back. Have a little tiny clear up. That's for when we rotate all this around. So I need to rotate the compound slide again. Helps if you push it. If you push it that way when you wind it, it kind of makes it move more easily. I'll just lock it off so it doesn't slide. You get a bit of a pain doing all this, but there you go. Just need to expose the two cap head screws under here. So I can loosen these off and rotate around. Now, I need to have this um, at a 50 degree angle. So if I, I don't know if you can see the drawing here. How well, that will show up on the camera. I can even get <laughs> in the view for you. Uh, right, so what I'm looking at is uh, this angle in here. So this is the this is the whole. Basically, it's, this is the orientation of it. So that's the part there, and then this is the uh, orientation. Let me just get that in view for you if I can. Everything's in the way at the moment. Uh, there you go, that's probably the best I can do. Right, so this angle in here for the chamfer is 50 degrees offset that way. So we need to set that up. So we'll get our protractor and work out which way we want to go. Let me just loosen these off. So we need that angle to be 50. So we need to set this to be, if I set that at 50 there, you just compare that to the drawing to make sure I've got the right angle. It's easy to be five degrees out with these things. So yeah, so basically if I, if I compare this to the drawing, just by offering it up, That's the angle, because it's easy to sort of get it wrong, get it in the wrong direction and do um, 40 degrees instead of 50 and be five degrees off either side. So that's the angle I want. So that's the angle I'm gonna put this at. Just gently kind of line that up. There we go. Just nip these up without moving anything. And give them a little tweak. No, it's not gonna go anywhere. Doesn't need to be mega tight, you know, just nip it up. Don't need white knuckles on this. Otherwise you'll have red knuckles when you try and undo it. So, just clean some of that swarf off the ways there. So, get this zoomed back in a little bit. And 
and I'm going to be using a little boring bar for that. So let's see how this sits on this side. Hopefully this will get in there. So we'll wind the, both slides in a bit, get the compound slide in a bit further. As I say, I'm just hoping that this will have enough clearance to be able to cut in there. Okay, right. I'm just gonna lock the, uh, I'm just gonna lock the saddle to the lead screw. First, I'm gonna make sure it's at, it is actually in neutral, otherwise that would be a bit of a tragedy. So start it up slowly. Gearbox in neutral, so lock the lead screw. And we'll start to cut our chamfer. Okay, so all that remains now is just to chamfer this edge and this edge, and then we're done. So I'm just going to rotate this round to 45, which is a shame. We could go, we could just go 50 because that's what we've got already. Um, but while, while we're at it, let's just uh, change it around a bit. Let's just lose the tool for a moment so we can get at things a bit more easily. And we'll back this out, put a chamfer on, and then we're done. Okay, so that's almost there. So let's just lay it in reverse. I'll turn the speed to zero, turn it on and slowly power it on. to go yet. How does that look? Oh, that's tidy. I'm happy with that. Now, can we reach the... Uh, the rear thread or the rear end as it were can we reach around this piece of thread without having a disaster uh no is the answer to that one by the look of it um oh, actually no what we can do is we can just swing the tool around a bit can't we we can just come in a bit like that and that should do it it's only just got to knock the edge off the uh, the hex there so that should be absolutely fine Yeah, I think that's good. So we'll do that, touch it off, and then we'll see where we go from there. It looks really close to the chuck, but I can, uh, as long as I see daylight there, I'm happy. I'm not gonna hit the chuck. that no, we're just touching i'll just do it until it looks even with the the one behind and then we're good a little bit more So 
So we're almost cutting the full radius. So yeah, I think it's a, almost there. I'm going to call that done. So there we go. Let's just uh, give you a mini guided tour of what we've got. You can see there's a bit of discoloration here, which is some of the rust from the hose connector that's sort of stuck on there. So that's it. So all we've got to do now is actually assemble it all together and uh, see if we get any leaks. All right, so we've got the new adapter fitted to the pressure washer gun and quiet. Uh -huh. Got a slight, um, slight little bit of water coming out of here, but um, I sealed this up with some PCFE plumbers tape, so I'll probably just need to get a little bit more on there. But to be honest, it's hardly any coming out. But anyway, let's uh, give it the acid test and see if it actually works. <laughs> I think we'll call that a success.